So hi everybody. Today I have decided to make a video about a pretty straightforward or basic topic, namely the transfer cable impedance and how to understand the transfer impedance and how to simulate it as it gives you an idea about the performance of the cable shield. So we we are asked often how to simulate transfer impedance and I made a very simple setup to explain to you how such a, a simulation can be done and the basic properties of cable transfer impedance. So typically when transfer impedance is measured, it's done by a so-called triaxial setup. So they are different setups. Sometimes it's just a tube when you put the cable inside. And we, we follow these ideas, but we don't completely redo the measurement setup because actually measuring transfer impedance can be quite complicated due to matching and the simulation itself is, is not as um, sensitive to, to this mismatch and we get a very nice dynamic range in the simulation. So typically the transfer impedance is, is measured in such a setup. So you have um, uh, the cable which, which we would like to test. So this is the cable. I have a very simple coaxial cable in a conductor, some dielectric here. So this is the dielectric and then on the outside there is a shield. And then we put this cable into a tube. That's why it's called sometimes the triaxial setup. And the basic idea is pretty simple. What we do is we create a current flow on the outside of the shield. Or basically in this outer tube, the current will flow here. It's excited by this particular port and make sure that there is a current loop basically formed like this. I can show this current loop to you. So this is the current now at, at one kilohertz. Let's go to the arrow plot. You see this is, I mean, it's plotted everywhere. So let's say this is the current on the, on the outer, on the tube. And then it flows here onto the shield and basically closing a loop like this. So this is our excitation. And then on, on this side, we short basically the outer loop down to the shield. And then we have a port here measuring the voltage. And if we have a current flowing here and we measure the voltage here, we get the transfer impedance. Basically, the higher the transfer impedance, the worse your shielding is because a certain current on the outside will induce a higher voltage on the inside. We can do this by voltages and currents, or we can just simply take the Z parameter. So Z12 is the transfer impedance from basically the outer loop here to the inner loop which is on the in flowing in the inside of the cable. And that's it. That's how you calculate the transfer impedance. And it's very simple measure. It will give you like for one amp of current flowing on the outside, what is the voltage created on the inside between the shield and the, and the inner conductor. It's pretty straightforward setup. And that's what we do here. So I have typical dimensions of a coax cable and I have a 10, cent uh, 10 millimeter length. So one centimeter of length is a very short section of the cable. And if you would like to simulate this, we have to mm, be aware of certain certain simulation settings. Because if I put a PEX here, so that's a perfect electric conductor. And obviously, a perfect electric conductor is also a perfect shield. So if I use a PEC material for the shield and calculate transfer impedance, it will be basically zero. You see, it's 1 E minus 64. Because the PEC material here, it completely separates the two loops, and we cannot calculate a, a, a realistic transfer impedance. So we have to do something different. We have to make sure that the shield is modeled properly. So the next simple step would be, of course, to take a so-called normal material. So this is a normal material, because a normal material is no longer a perfect shield. The current can penetrate into this material and can thus, when it penetrates, it can get from the outside to the inside of the cable. So I have here, I use uh, something like a conductivity of copper and 200 microns of thickness that I have here. And if we run the simulation, we can now take a look at the result. So let's go here. We have the normal copper. And we see there is some shielding. So overall, at low frequencies, we have something like 0.1 uh, milli, milli ohm. And then we see some shielding, but that doesn't look good. I mean, actually, that's not not a realistic result, because if you're familiar with the transfer impedance, you would expect that 
simply due to the skin depth, a high frequency current can no longer penetrate through the conductor, you should see a much higher uh, uh, shielding, that means a much lower transfer impedance at the higher frequency. And that's obviously not happening here. And the reason is, as I already mentioned, it's the skin depth. We have to make sure that we properly resolve the skin depth. So what we could do is we could now take this normal, normal conductor as I did and add some, some mesh helpers there yeah, to make sure that we no longer have just a, one mesh line, that we have multiple mesh lines in the thickness. And if we do so, things actually get better. Let's go here, transfer impedance. So we have the normal copper and the normal copper result with the skin depth result. You see already at the higher frequencies, the transfer impedance is becoming lower, but still you would expect it to fall off much, much more downwards. So this is as good as the mesh was able to resolve the skin depth, but it's not accurate enough for this higher frequency. So I'm here from basically from one hertz to 200 megahertz. And therefore we need to make sure that we use uh, some clever approach and this clever approach is named tin panel. So a tin panel material, if I move here, it's a special type of material. So the, the shield itself, it doesn't have any thickness, but the thickness and the uh, penetration through the metal is modeled mathematically inside this material. So that means I do not need to resolve the particular thickness of the shield because this is defined already by the material. So you can see that's a material type called copper tin panel and got a thickness of 0.2 millimeters. So now I have the real thickness, not in the 3D model, but in the material properties. And when I do this way now, and we look at the, so we have the normal copper with the normal copper with the skin depth. And if we add the tin panel material now, you can see this is what you would expect from the skin depth. So we have to make sure that we properly resolve because it, it comes really down to resolving how much of the current can penetrate through the conductor of a particular thickness. And you can see at this low frequencies they agree very well. And here up to something like 1.5 megahertz, my additional skin depth meshing was, was helping to increase the accuracy. But at the higher frequencies, simply my mesh was not good enough. So taking this tin panel model is giving you a high accuracy and it's also giving you the advantage not to require to mesh the, the skin depth, which is a very nice thing. So that, that gives us a very good now tool. We know how to simulate this. We know how to obtain the realistic values for the transfer impedance. But what's next is you have to be careful because the transfer impedance is like the absolute value for this particular setup. If we have like one amp of current at 10 megahertz, we would get something like uh, 1.8 E minus 7 volt inside the material. But this is again an absolute value would now depends on the length of the cable. Because if we, if we have a longer cable and the same current is flowing on this longer cable, a higher voltage will be induced inside. So what we could do is, of course, we could now make this, we could take this thin panel model as we had simulated for one meter of cable, right? So now we have the one meter of cable and typically the transfer impedance is often normed to one meter. However, if we do so, so normal tip, let's go thin panel and thin panel with long. You can see, obviously, at the low frequencies, we have a higher coupling. And then, I mean, it behaves mm, as we would expect. But what you see is actually you are getting some resonances. And in the simulation right here, it doesn't look that bad. But I know from measurements, typically, you will see this resonance in a transfer impedance measurement because you, you're no longer matching your ports properly. So this is why I typically would say, I mean, the best way is actually to to simulate just a short section of the cable and then scale the transfer impedance you have obtained to one meter length because this way you make sure that these resonances of your cable setup are no longer captured. Uh, you don't have that easy option in your in your measurement setup because in the measurement setup you typically choose a fixed length. But be aware that this length of the cable plays an important role and make sure that you get the raw data and get rid of the resonances as much as possible. So we have now done, a, so there was a very thin, so there was just basically a foil of 200 meter thickness. We didn't have any, any geometrical details, but if you look at like a cable shielding, typically using braid, 
So if we want to model breaks, why not? Let's add some holes to this. So I have taken out the same tin panel model as you can see here, as I had before. And now I have added holes. So I cut in holes. Of course, in the simulation, you can now parameterize the holes, make them bigger, make them smaller and so on. But what would be the main point? I mean, it's a, a little bit simplified model because the braid will have some small conductors and it will go up and down. You can model all of this, but it takes them time to create the cut model. While I choose here the simple, the simple approach, just cutting holes into the, into the shield and looking how these holes actually affect the transfer impedance. And maybe we don't need the normal, let's say that this is the tin panel we had before, which was just a solid of 2.2 millimeter. And now we, if we add holes, we see what's happening. At the lower frequencies, I mean, the transfer impedance is slightly higher simply because the, the adding the holes is adding, a, a I mean, it's, it's, the, it's increasing the resistance. So um, our impedance is also increasing. But what's much more important is that actually starting at the higher frequencies already around one megahertz. You saw I had a lot of holes in there already at one megahertz. You see how the transfer impedance becoming higher. And it's telling you that the braid is not a good shield at higher frequencies simply because the current can easily diffuse through these holes to from the top of the shield to the bottom of the shield. And this is the voltage that you see in your uh, uh, then in, in the inner conductor so um, what typically is done when you look at how people do a double shielding is typically they basically combine what they combine here is a foil which is a good shield uh, has a low transfer impedance is a good shield at high frequencies and the braid which typically the braid is not better at low frequencies than a foil if they have the same thickness. But typically what you do, you choose a braid which has a, a higher thickness than the foil. And in this way, you make sure that you have a good shielding at the low frequencies due to the thickness of the braid. And then when the holes basically affect your shielding effectiveness, you put in a, a thin foil because the foil is a good shield the higher frequency and that's exactly what I've done here. So we have still the same uh, the, the same braid here with 0.2 millimeters. And below this, I put a foil tin panel with just 50 microns. It's very, very thin, how you typically a foil would be. And now the both shields are in there. If we now look at the cable uh, and the transfer impedance here, going on to the schematic and visualizing what we had before. That was the tin panel. That was the tin panel with the braid and the holes. And we add this very tin foil already. You see, you get a very nice broadband shield, a very low transfer impedance over the whole frequency domain up to 200 megahertz. So that's basically the secret of double shielded cables. And it's, it's easy to be simulated and easily to see how you set up such a simulation. In the end, what you of course could do, you could combine the transfer impedance of these two shield layers into one, choose a 10 panel model and put it in a complex environment because that's actually what you in the end interested in. So this is just a, a, simple, a simple exercise, how to simulate the transfer impedance. But of course, later on, you would take these cables and simulate them in, a, in, in its environment, including all the properties of your shield. So that's a very simple thing. I think pretty basic knowledge. I hope you have enjoyed today's videos. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe as they say on YouTube. Bye bye.